Hello, my name is Philippe Girard, a professor in the history department at Pakistan State University. I'm Candy Thornton, a history major at MSU. And my name is Gavin Labiche. I'm a senior student in the history department at McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music, culture, and history, as we retrace the lives of a remarkable woman. From humble beginnings, she rose all the way to the imperial seat in the legendary city of Byzantium. And then led the reforms that improved the legal standing of low-class women throughout the empire. She was also a gifted advisor who saved her husband's career during the Nika revolts. And a fashion advisor of sorts, who thought the purple was the noblest shroud. Wait, what is that supposed to mean? Like, orange is the new blank? It's more complicated than that. We'll get to it in due time. Amazingly, she did all this at a time where it was socially unacceptable for women to speak up while men were discussing politics. As if this weren't enough, she was an alleged prostitute. And an actual saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. She was as controversial as she was loved. Her name was... Theodora. She was the empress of the Byzantine Empire in today's Greece and Turkey. During the program, we will be sampling songs about empowered women as well as selections from surviving Byzantine hymns. Well, contemporary pop and rock and centuries-old religious music from a fallen empire. That's quite a mix you got there. I could have stuck only to music from the period, but intuition told me that might not be the most interesting for our listener at home or in their dorms. Wise choice. So what is your first selection? Short Skirt and Long Jacket by Cake. It showcases the duality of expectations for women, to have the ability to seduce a partner, but also maintain a professional life, a conflict that Theodora expertly managed in her own time. I usually pick songs because they're groovy disco beats from the 70s. You seem to have put much more thought into it than I do. And welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks. We just finished listening to Cake's 2001 single, Short Skirt, Long Jacket. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Gavin Labiche. Today on the show, we are examining the life of Empress Theodora of the Byzantine Empire. So let's start at the beginning of her life. I assume that to become an empress, you must start your life as a princess of some sort. No, not at all. She was the daughter of an actress slash prostitute, then became co-regent and saint. Wow, there must have been quite a journey in between. Yes, absolutely. So which time period are we talking about here? The 6th century. She was born in 500 AD. So a very long time ago then. So what are the sources like? I found that doing women's history can be difficult because sources are few, especially for the early medieval period. Most of the information about her accomplishments in life came from the historian Procopius. Ironically, the steamy, slanderous gossip about her life was also supposedly written by Procopius. So, her fan letters and hate mail seem to be, have been written by the same person. Procopius was the ultimate mean girl, flattering and charming, but with a penchant for slandering his royal patrons. 
Great reference, Professor Gerard. You are very sharp on your early aughts teen comedies. Congratulations. Well, I have three teenage girls, so don't tell my department head, but I spend way more time watching rom-coms than doing research in the archives. Procropius wrote three official accounts of the royal couple's life that were largely positive, and his so-called secret history where they were accused of all manners of impieties. All manner of impieties? What's that supposed to mean? That her husband, Justinian, was a demon who could detach his head and roam the halls of the palace at nighttime. Oh, what did he call the emperor's wife then? A witch? Almost. Just change the first letter. In this account, Theodore was the low-born daughter of a prostitute and a bear keeper, who slept and flirted her way to the top. The daughter of a prostitute and a bear keeper. I'll let that sink in for a second. I can't imagine what her childhood was like. Procopius claims that Theodora, before she met her future husband, was infamous for a nude performance where birds ate grain off of her lower body. It makes sleazy bars in Florida look almost classy by comparison. The Romans spared no expense in their slanderous propaganda. Okay, we need to pause for a second here. Why are Romans involved here? I thought we were in Greece. The western part of the Roman Empire, such as Italy, fell by the 476 CE. But the eastern part, including Greece, survived, and that's what we call the Byzantine Empire. All right. The question I'm asking myself is why. Why did Theodore's life inspire some and disgusted others? The answer to that question is both simpler and more complicated than one might think. Given the short amount of time until we take our next break, I think the short answer would do nicely for now. Simply put, they're probably just being haters. By all account, Theodora wielded significant influence with her husband, which made certain Romans suspicious of her intentions. So the account by Procopius may be less than unbiased. The classic seductress hungry for power trope paired with a weak, ineffectual ruler trope. I've seen that before. Which also means that the entire story about her being an exotic nude dancer may have been a lie, manufactured by jealous enemies. We're only relying on one source here, so we've got to be careful before we jump to conclusions. That's a question for our listeners to mull over during the next song. Is it possible that these less than generous characterizations of Theodore's background are in any way founded? With that tantalizing cliffhanger, we now go to our second song. So what is that song? A song about all the liars and the dirty, dirty cheats of the world and how the haters gonna hate, 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 and we're gonna shake it all off? No, no Taylor Swift, sorry. Our second song is some ancient Byzantine music from Theodore's life about the glory of the capital of Byzantium. Enjoy. Gavin LaBiche, co-host of this episode of Your Grandma Rocks, your favorite women's history show on KBYS. I'm Candy Thornton. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université MacNeese. Before our musical break, we were discussing Empress Theodora of Byzantium and whether she deserved the criticism she endured. I.e., whether she was actually a low-life dancer known for a specialty act involving nudity, birds, and strategically placed seeds. You got it. Suspicions of Theodora and her husband Justinian probably were the results of resentment over their origin. Theodora was the daughter of an actress. 
a profession of very, very low social standing back then. Many Christian priests were not even bury actors for centuries. And Justinian was only one generation removed from peasantry. These humble beginnings bred resentment among the fat cats. But it's also precisely what bonded them together when they were officially married in 525 CE. So what was their marriage like? The whole notion of a romantic marriage didn't really emerge until the 18th and 19th centuries. It was a real marriage. The union was rock solid. They shared the power, if not officially, then in practice, and each had projects they pursued with largely successful results. The fact that they were a solid couple can only have angered all the people who were jealous of those two. Right? When Justinian was crowned emperor in 527, he insisted that Theodora be crowned empress and not just consort. Meaning as co-ruler of the empire rather than just the wife of. Right. I'm sure that went over well in the early medieval society. Sure. While today the mistrust by authors like Procopius would be seen as misogyny, back then it must have been jarring to suddenly have a woman, and a low-born one at that, who had power only matched by the emperor. So, how did a low-born woman marry an emperor anyway? Aren't you supposed to be a noble to marry an emperor? Justinian pushed through new laws just to be able to marry her and legitimized her daughter. I appreciate that act of love, but that can't have been popular with crusty old aristocrats. The legal reforms were just beginning. All right, let's talk about the juicy, sexy topic of ancient legal reform then. It was a tabloid journalist dream for sure. All jokes aside, she actually did further the rights of women in the Byzantine Empire. She passed laws to stop young women from being trafficked. She was known to buy prostitutes, free them, and then provide for their wellness. She even got women legal rights in divorce proceedings. It's interesting that she's a Roman proto-feminist. I mean, in traditional Roman law, the family was headed by the man, the pater familias, who had right of life and death over his wife and kids. That surprised me too. When I think of Rome, I think of a brutal macho patriarchy, not feminist reformers. Byzantium was a different time and place than Rome, I suppose. However, she certainly inherited a brutal streak from her cultural heritage that makes her undeniably Roman. Here comes the blood and gore. After all those laws were passed, the Nika revolt broke out against Justinian's reforms. Oh, I know about that one. I teach about it in my world history course. That was a political riot for sure, but interestingly, the two camps were also divided by their sports allegiances. Sports? Yes, members of one political party would be rooting for one team of charioteers in the horse races, and members of the other political party would root for the other team. And they were known by the color of that team. So the blues were the aristocrats, and the greens were the common people. I know we live in some pretty tense times politically, but at least it hasn't spilled into sports. Yet. Well, I'm not so sure. Championship teams have been known to come to the White House. Or not, depending on whether they support the president. Think of Megan Rapinoe and the soccer world champions last summer. Kneeling during the national anthem can also be a pretty political act nowadays. Or doing the black power salute during the 1968 Olympics. Or when a black sprinter won the gold medal in front of Hitler during the 36 Olympics. All right, you win. Well, the Byzantines were precursors of the, all that then. Anyway, during the Nika revolt, Theodore refused to leave the city, telling her husband that purple is the noblest shroud. Purple being the color of the emperors, right? Yes, it was very expensive dye made by crushing little seashells. So, Theodore preferred an honorable death than life in exile. In the end, she got to keep both her honor and her life. She and Justinian stayed put and remained in office. Wow, she was a tough cookie. She was. After the Nika revolt, Theodora turned her eyes to her enemies who had tried to depose her. She had Justinian's best general round them up in the Hippodrome. Again with the chariot races. Yes, except they were not there to cheer. Theodora had her general slaughter all her opponents. Yep, she was definitely Roman. Let's kill a bunch of people and do it in the arena to make it entertaining. Another song while we wait for all these poor guys to die? Here is a song by a modern woman who also wields incredible power and has learned about the large responsibility that comes with it. I only know of one woman in the world who wield that kind of power today. That would be Beyonce, right? Bingo. Here is 2011's Run the World by Beyonce.
Bonjour à tous and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. This was Run the World by Beyoncé. Je suis Philippe Girard. I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Gavin Labiche. Today we're discussing Theodora of the Byzantine Empire. So far we've mentioned how historians slandered her because she was of low birth and how she wielded considerable power as the wife of Emperor Justinian in the 500s. All right, so there is one big thing that we haven't mentioned yet. It's a real doozy, too. What in God's name is that? Well, it actually has to do with God. We never steer away from hot topics on the show, so religion it is. What was that issue? The emperor and the empress didn't share a religion. Oh, okay, so he was a Christian and she was a Muslim? The prophet Muhammad lived a century later, so no, she wasn't Muslim. So much for teaching world history. So what were they? Justin was a Chalcedon and Theodore was a monophyte. I don't want to repeat myself, but what in God's name is that? Both groups were Christian, but they disagreed on the exact nature of Jesus. You mean whether Jesus was one and the same with God, or whether he was more of a human nature? I know that question was a huge deal in Byzantium. Exactly. Accusations of heresy flew around any time those two groups got together. Wait, people disagreeing to the point of violence about minute details in theology? That's unheard of. <laughs> Who would have guessed? The royal couple didn't seem to mind, though. Well, Justinian didn't seem to mind. Theodora was a bit more aggressive, and she had to be. Her side was the minority faction. So, bold removers were required. Such as founding her own monastery to preserve the life of her faction's leaders. Anathimus and Severus were among the ones she protected. Snape was there? Wow, that's wild. Um, not quite. Different guy. Theodora and Justinian also combined religious zeal and administrative talents to produce great works of architecture, chiefly the Hagia Sophia. Even if you never heard that name, you've seen pictures of it in that huge church in the middle of Istanbul today. Though it's no longer a church, it became a mosque when the Ottomans took over the city in the 15th century. And it's now a museum. It was a groundbreaking piece of architecture and was built with an absolutely huge Roman-style dome. The Hagia Sophia was built to replace the previous big church in Byzantium, which had been destroyed during, you guessed it, the Nikah riots. That church was dedicated to both Justinian and Theodora equally. Personally, I think they managed their diverging faiths pretty well. This benefited the entire Eastern Empire, propelling it into another thousand years of relevance. The Byzantines held on to their half of the Roman Empire until 1453, a millennium after the Western Roman Empire fell. Kudos to them then, and hooray for the religious tolerance. But let's shift to a more important topic. What's our next song? It is a 1971 classic, I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. That's where you're going to give us some deep interpretation of the song and where it fits into our story? Will do. This song is about a woman at the outset of the second wave feminism defining herself and finding independence. Theodora was a torchbearer for that same sentiment one and a half millennium earlier. So it fits. Just like Cinderella in her shoe, it fits. Here is I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. To go back and pretend Cause I've heard it all before And I've been down there on the floor No one's ever gonna keep me down again Well, yes, I am wise But it's wisdom for the pain Yes, I paid the price But look how much I gained It only serves to make me more determined to achieve my final goal. And I come back even stronger, not an
You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KVYS. You just heard I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. I'm Gavin Labiche. I'm Candy Thornton. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. Today we are exploring the life of Empress Theodora. So far we have seen her rise from obscurity to the throne of Byzantium, a thousand year long empire that was the heir to the Roman Empire. We also saw her prevail in the Nika riots and protect her side during religious conflicts. And how she helped build the Hagia Sophia, the most impressive architectural remnants of the Byzantine era. Now we have to get to the sad part, unfortunately. We will make it brief, but it must be done. So, how did she die? Assassination? Popular revolt? Burnt as a heretic? No, probably cancer. That's surprising considering all the dangers she had faced in her life. How old was she? She died in uh, 548. She was born in 500, so even a history major can do the math. She was just 48. How did her husband take it? We focused on her because it's a woman's history show, but today's story is really the story of a powerful couple that loved each other and worked together. Justinian was notably shaken and emotional at her funeral. He never really recovered from this because for the next 17 years of his reign, he seemed stripped of his ambition and vigor. Hardly any more legislation passed in the years after her death. Justinian was there in body, but not in mind. That can't have been good for the empire. The reign of Justinian is usually cited as the high watermark of the Byzantine Empire, but it was pretty much downhill from there. He couldn't bring himself to struggle anymore because he lost his partner. How sweet. I'm not sure either could work without the other. Justinian was too naive in trusting people who may not have had Byzantium's best interests at heart. Meanwhile, Theodore's more brutal tendencies would have gone too far with disastrous results. Interesting dynamic, though. In history, typically the king plays the role of the hot ass who fights battles and kills enemies, and the queen is supposed to soften his instincts and inject some love and mercy into the reign. In their case, the dynamic was thrown upside down. That's fascinating. Good thing they found each other when they did. What's our next song? I'm a Survivor by Reba McIntyre. The lyrics fit our story closely. I don't believe in self-pity. It only brings you down. It may be the queen of broken heart, but I don't hide behind the crown. When the deck is stacked against me, I just play a different game. My roots are planted in the past. It's like Theodora wrote the song. I was born three months too early. The doctor gave me 30 days. But I must have had my mama's will And God's amazing grace I guess I'll keep on living Even if this love's to die for Cause your bags are packed and I ain't crying You're walking out and I'm not trying To change your mind cause I was a born to be The baby girl without a chance A victim of circumstance She's just too hard-headed A single mom who works two jobs Who loves her kids and never stops With gentle hands and the heart of a fighter I'm a survivor I don't believe in self-pity It only brings you down Maybe the queen of broken hearts But I don't hide behind the crown When the deck is stacked against me I just play a different game My roots are planted in the past And though my life is changing fast Who I am is who I want to be The baby girl without a chance A victim of
Bienvenue à tous. Je suis Philippe Girard. And I'm Candy Thornton. This was I'm a Survivor by Reba McIntyre. And I'm Gavin Labiche. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS, a show dedicated to remarkable women from ages past. And Theodora, the Empress of Byzantium, sure fits the bill. She rose from obscurity to absolute power. She eliminated her enemies. She helped build the biggest church in Christendom. Maybe I should plan a trip to see the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul next summer. I've always dreamed of visiting the place. Do you know that there are actually Viking graffiti in that church? Viking graffiti? What were the Vikings doing all the way down in Greece? They were hired as bodyguards by the Emperor of Byzantium. They were pagans, so they would get really bored during church service, and they would etch their name in runes into the stone. Wow, Viking graffiti, Roman slash Byzantium architecture, and then a Muslim mosque? That's a whole lot of layers of history. Well, that's it for today. What an incredible life that was. Quelle vie incroyable en effet. Thank you and goodbye. Au